1942. This is your Pinnacle host, reporter Doug Alderson, once again proud to bring you up close and personal the world news and newsmakers through the technical wizardry of moving pictures and high quality sound reproduction. This week's segment is titled For the Birds. Since I'm privileged to interview America's most famous ornithologist and bird writer, Dr. Frank M. Chapman. He's a spry 78 year old gentleman who this week retires from the American Museum of Natural History in New York City after a stellar 54 year career. New Yorker Magazine profiled our guest a few years back, noting that not since the great Audubon has a single person interested more people in birds than Dr. Chapman. Others have called him the Dean of American Ornithologists and the godfather of the modern American bird watching movement. So welcome Dr. Chapman. And uh, I wanted to show you some photos from your career and just want to ask you about this photo. Where was this taken? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Olson. Your fame has preceded you. I watched uh, the newsreel of you in London during the Blitz uh, just a year or so ago. And uh, I, I admire your work. And uh, thank you for, for paying attention to an old man and, and how he spent his life. Uh, this picture, I recognize him right off. Uh, this was taken not long ago in Coconut Grove, Florida. I've, we've had a home, Fanny and I have had a home there for some years. And, it's also a bird uh, study station. I mean, Florida has been my, among my first loves. It's an Eden for birds even today, despite all the threats. And uh, here I am, and uh, what can I say? Uh, you know, this is what happens to you after 77 years. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm still here, and I'm looking forward to uh, a few more. Wonderful. So this shot looks like Central Park to me. Why would they be looking at birds in Central Park? That's it. That's it. That's where I came from. I'm here in New York City. Oh, okay. American Museum. And uh, one of my pleasures is, as often as I can, I lead uh, bird trips through Central Park, which is a gigantic uh, piece of habitat and full of birds. And oh, uh, we saw some wonderful birds today. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is. Uh, you know, the Audubon birders, and uh, I, I believe this was taken during one of the Christmas bird counts. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know if your viewers are familiar with uh, the Audubon Christmas yes. count. Uh, would you like me to uh, give them an explanation? Or? Yes, I believe you started the Christmas bird count. Is that correct? Well, <laughs> well by God, I did. I did. It was back in 1899 in December. And really, the bird count, the Christmas bird count, which now tracks thousands, uh, came to my mind in reaction to a tradition that was popular then, but it's almost extinct now. And I'm glad, to, glad that I can say that. And that was the Christmas side hunt. As a, as a friend of mine once said, it was a murder game. And what you do, and it varied, but you'd pick sides Christmas Day while the goose was cooking, and uh, one team would compete with the other to see how many living creatures, mainly birds, that they could kill before a certain time. And the one with the highest pile of carcasses, most of which were just left to rot, uh, was the winner. And I thought to myself, we've got to change this culture and, and how to do it. Well, I know people are competitive. Uh, what, what I did, uh, it was devise a Christmas bird con where you would go rather than shoot the birds. And when I say shoot birds, I'm not talking about game birds. I'm talking about songbirds, owls, hawks, whatever they saw. But in the bird count, the idea is to count and identify a species that first year it was 1899 or 1900, we had 25 volunteers that did it. And uh, the results were, were, were good. Uh, today, we have thousands. And uh, who knows in the future? Uh, I'm talking to a friend. He says in another 50 years, we might have 70,000 people. I don't know. That sounds an incredible number to me, but we can always hope. Now, the 
side effect is the more people we get to do this, and they provide the Audubon societies with detailed data on the bird population, which gives our ornithologists the information they need to determine population densities, uh, the location, migration patterns, on and on. And every year the data gets better. Uh, so today we have many, many thousands who enjoy the Christmas bird count and they compete against each other to see who can get the most birds listed and the most uh, species. Yeah, they don't uh, harm anything. And uh, well, thank you for doing that. That's I go on. It's, it, I'm quite uh, proud of, of of that. Yes, we. I believe there's some photos that may illustrate some of what you're talking about here too. Oh, oh, <laughs> well, that brings tell us about this. Photo. Uh, Mr. Alderson, this was my boyhood home in Englewood, West Englewood, New Jersey. Oh. It was a beautiful old home. Uh, my father was a Wall Street uh, banker, a Wall Street attorney who worked for banks. My grandfather was a banker as well. And he would commute each day. In those days though, uh, this was on Teaneck Road. It was a rural uh, community. We, we actually had a, an orchard here, about 45 acres. My ma maternal grandfather, Charles Parkhurst, he, he took care of the orchard, he lived with us. And uh, what a place for a, a boy to, to grow up. It was 1864 when I was born. Don't remember it, but they told me that was when it happened. And uh, as a boy, I tramped the woods and marshes. And actually the New Jersey Palisades, those great cliffs were located only, only a, a few miles away. I spent, uh, as I got older, I spent many times there. I, I have many bird memories. Uh, in the right season when the cherry trees blossomed uh, near the house, I would climb the trees and, and devour the cherries. Uh, and my, my dinner companions were cedar waxwings, a flock of them all fluttering around eating, eating them and I was eating them with me. Sometimes I thought I was one of the birds. Uh, and uh, later I would walk down to the Palisades and we would uh, see the duck hawks. Oh, excuse me, that term is uh, antiquated. Today they're called peregrine falcons, a wonderful, wonderful predatory bird, uh, dives, achieves great speeds, some say perhaps 200 miles an hour. And uh, I would study their nests there and just uh, lie back. Uh, the birds were my friends, my companions, the woods, the marshes, uh, the orchards, small farms. It was a a paradise for birds and for those who love them. We are so fortunate you didn't become a banker and you became a birder. Uh, it was a, uh, I started out as a banker. Uh, perhaps later we'll talk how, how that okay. all panned out. Oh, what a beautiful scene here. Oh yes, we're down in Florida. And oh yes. Florida is the first time I saw semi-tropical birds and the great waving birds. Uh, this was near Gainesville, uh, they call it uh, today, I think, Payne's Prairie. Uh, we, we called it at that time the uh, uh, Lake Alachua, or the Alachua Sink. And uh, this would, it was a natural effect, this would sometimes drain, but when this was taken, when I first went there, I believe that was in 1888, my mother had bought a winter cottage there. And uh, that was my first exposure to the birds of Florida. And uh, it was a, a wonderful experience to see, especially the great wading birds, the herons, the egrets, and uh, so many other anhingas, birds that were so exotic to me that I'd read about uh, in New Jersey, but had never seen. And Florida became a big part of my life from 1888 till now, I spend all or part of every winter in Florida. Yes. All right. Oh, it looks like another Florida scene. I see the Spanish moss and everything. Oh, yes, yes. That was, that was on the Indian River Lagoon, which is truly a magnificent patch of, of wild Florida. Uh, very few people live there. You can see the lady on the right the far right in the light colored dress. And uh, 
She was a mother to uh, the naturalists. Uh, back in those days, uh, uh, those of us interested in the natural world, uh, they, they called us all naturalists. Today, uh, they use terms like wildlife biologists or ornithologists. But back then, we were, we were naturalists. Ma Latham was formally uneducated, but she was a student of nature, and I admired her so much. And uh, she, the most famous, the most distinguished naturalists in the country would come to her lodge and study the birds. In fact, uh, my wife and I spent our honeymoon in 1898 at Ma Latham's, uh, but that's, that's an, another story. But she was a great lady and told wonderful stories. I remember one, she was on the beach and a black bear came after her. A black bear was down there eating uh, sea turtle eggs. They love to dig up the nest. And uh, she uh, was quick thinking. She turned around and opened her parasol or umbrella and started snapping it and opening it. And the bear uh, panicked and, and took off in the other direction. She was, she was quite a lady, I must say. Okay. Uh, so this is, um, I believe, your yes. mentor, right? So you didn't explore a degree in ornithology because they didn't really have a degree, right? That's, that's correct. Uh, when I was a young man, uh, I went to high school, and uh, frankly, I was more interested in baseball and track. I did what was necessary, but the classes didn't engage me. They never talked about what I was interested in, birds and, and wild creatures, the forest, and never heard anything. So why go to college? Just more of the same. And, uh, but really, my university <laughs> was Dr. Joel Asif Allen, and here he is as a relatively young man. And I worked for him as a volunteer at first at the American Museum of Natural History here at right on Central Park, 88th Street. And he took me on, and I must say, he was my mentor, my teacher, my university, but he became more than that. I had lost my father, as you may know, when I was 11. And uh, I met him, I was age 25, and he became my father in so many ways. And our deaths were together for 30 years, I believe. Uh, he was a, a fine, fine man. I miss him. Ah, so <laughs> this is you, is that correct? Oh, to be young again. Yes, this yes. early on, I, I don't recall the exact year. I, I had a lot more hair then, and I was in better shape. But uh, yes, this is, this is at the museum, and uh, that was a, a godsend for me. Uh, you know, back when I I had a career from age 17 to about 24, 25, I think it was eight or nine years, in a bank in New York. And I was making good money, and I didn't hate it. But what I loved, my passion, was birds. And uh, it came to a point where I had to make a decision, bird man or banker. And uh, I spoke with my mother. We always were very close. She was a great woman, a wonderful pianist. Our, our, our home was full of music at all, all times. And a lovely painter, uh, later when I did uh, magic uh, lantern shows, I guess they call them slide shows today, uh, she would uh, hand color the, the slides for me. And she always encouraged me and she told me, she said, Frank, you know, if it's in your heart and you want to do this, follow your dream. And that was wonderful and that's when we when I resigned from the bank, to the horror of my colleagues, because at that time there were perhaps about a dozen men in all of the United States who made their living as naturalists, and even then many of them had zoology degrees. There wasn't such a thing as an ornithology degree. There was not uh, a university in the nation. But again, uh, as I said, Dr. Allen took me on, took me under his wing, and he, uh, he taught me. I was in effect an apprentice to him for 30 years. Okay. Uh, so a lot of our younger listeners may not know about the, the bird plume trade here. So help us uh, understand what's going on here in these photos. Well, well thank God that your younger viewers don't know this. Uh, uh, 
the birds, when I was a young man in the 1880s and 90s, were dying by the millions, and they had so many, so many threats. We had the market hunters shooting them, the waterfowl were just being slaughtered. We had the plume hunters. Now that was, that was true mayhem. Uh, and it was dictated by fashion, fashion soaked in blood. As you can see, these women are wearing parts of birds. Uh, this is an egret or a breeding bird feather. I'm going to guess it was a snowy egret. And this lady, no offense to the ladies, they, they didn't know any better. Uh, the country didn't know any better. We were still the frontier and we thought these resources were endless. And a big part of my career, along with many others, was a campaign to change the culture again, to convince the women to avoid wearing and buying these hats. If you have to understand the millinery trade, the hat manufacturers in the 1890s employed 85,000 workers in New York City. They were a power, powerful interest group, and they fought us to within nail. And my role in that was to bring them the truth. And I found that America's women responded splendidly. Uh, almost all of them, once they knew that this fashion uh, trend r resulted in the death of birds. And, and let me tell you, it, for instance, these aigrets, these are breeding plumage. So they would come to the Everglades, which was a great site for uh, the beautiful snowy egrets and the roseate spoonbills. And I know at the time they were killing any bird you could imagine. Sometimes they wore entire songbirds in their hats. Uh, and uh, it was a, a terrible thing. Uh, these plume hunters, they were poor men. Uh, they could go and kill the birds during breeding season. Well, the result was they would take a few of the feathers, which they could sell for twice their weight in gold. Yes. And they would be bought by the hat manufacturers. But killing the adults during the breeding season left the young birds in the nest to die a slow death. And there's nothing more pathetic to come into a shot out bird rookery. First of all, you smell it a half mile away, the rotting corpses of the adult birds thrown aside after they take a few feathers. And then the young, the piteous cries and calling for their, for their, their mothers for, and fathers for food. This was wrought by the plume hunters. Here's an example on the left. This was a terrible problem. And for the first 30 years of my career, it was a focus of, of my efforts and many, many others. Uh, it was a terrible, terrible phenomenon. And this also resulted in uh, the death of humans too, who tried to defend yes. the birds, right? Yes, this man, I, I met him once. He was a fine young man. He lived in Flamingo, uh, there on the Everglades, right down by Florida Bay. Uh, he had been one of the, the butchers. Uh, he lived there and he, he killed the, the, the birds for plumes. His name was Guy Bradley. But you know, Guy told me he just was sickened, sickened at the slaughter. And he joined us uh, as an Audubon warden, uh, one of our first, he may have been the first in Florida, I'm not sure. But I met him, oh gosh, uh, the early 1900s and I spoke to him and uh, he, was, he was distraught, uh, but he wasn't intimidated. And you have to understand, Florida was a frontier state, especially down there at that time, there was no law. Uh, the law was in Key West, uh, 80 miles away by boat. So, uh, a man had to take care of himself. You see a badge, he was an Audubon warden, and they did make him a Monroe County uh, deputy, but uh, he knew that it was a dangerous occupation, and I left him, and I, I felt that he knew he would be murdered. And he was, I believe, the next year by uh, one of the plumers. And uh, that man never, never was indicted, uh, whether it was because his neighbors uh, in the grand jury in Key West uh, sympathized with him, 
or they were afraid of him. I don't know. He was a dangerous character. He was a Confederate veteran who'd been a sniper during that war. And he, he shot down Guy Bradley. He wasn't our only uh, uh, warden to die. That's for sure. Oh, here's you. Uh, looks like a <laughs> tropical environment here. Oh, I'm losing more hair. Uh, they, they, picture by picture. My gosh, you have no pity. Uh, I was very tired in this picture. This was in Colombia. And uh, that was a big part of my career. Uh, I, I led uh, two expeditions in person to Colombia in 1911, 1913. And of course, we were collecting birds. That was shotgun ornithology. Some people don't understand it. But we needed these birds uh, to study them in hand. Now, here in my 54, 55 year career, I've seen a change and I've been part of that change. These have made a big difference. Uh, when I started in 1888, people would go uh, to watch birds with opera glasses, about three or four magnification. But as the years went by, the binoculars got better and better and our field identification techniques grew better. And then, of course, the cameras were just phenomenal progress to where by 1900, I wrote a book, uh, The Use of uh, Cameras in, in Bird Study. And uh, that was the first book written in, in this country, but now dozens have been written. And what we saw is a gradual move away from the shotgun ornithology. But here, we were trying to get these these birds uh, for the museum for study skins. When people go to the museum, any museum, certainly the American Museum of Natural History today, uh, they see only a small part of our collection. We have bird skins. These are a product of a, a taxidermist or a, or a field biologist. And uh, we tuck them away in drawers and uh, they stay fresh. The colors are vivid for years and uh, we study them and future generations can study them. I think we had, I'm not sure, I think we had six or 7,000 bird skins uh, at the museum when I began. And uh, now I believe it's about 800,000, uh, the largest, oh. if not the largest in the, in the world. But that's what it was. It was in Colombia. That was, I think that was 1913, the second time I went down there. Okay. Ah. Now my companion in Colombia and many, many expeditions was uh, this young man. He was in college. He was out of Cornell. And uh, he was my son. I did have a son, Frank Jr., later second opera. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a personal note. But this young fellow was uh, Luis Gazes Fuertes. And he was a genius bird artist. I think the heir to Audubon. And in time, we worked together in Mexico. We worked together in uh, the Bahamas, uh, of course, Colombia, Yucatan, uh, Ecuador. He was a wonderful companion in the field. He was a, an artist and a, and a biologist. Just, uh, I, I called him Fuertes. His last name was Fuertes. I called him Fuertes. I love this man. And uh, he just was, ah, oh, this is one of my favorite, favorite Fuertes portraits. This was, I believe, in Ecuador. And it's a, a chestnut-eared aracari. The birds down there are fantastic, vividly colored, and, and just an just a infinite variety. And this, this shows you Fuertes' genius. Uh, and uh, later he, he helped me in creating our, our lifelike wildlife dioramas at the museum, which I hope we get to talk about later. But uh, look at that bird. It's, it talks to you. You can, hear, you can hear the call. Very talented, yes. Yes, he was. And a fine man. Oh, look at this scene. Must be <laughs> yes. Fun. Well, we went down. This was Columbia. And of course, we went into the high Andes. And in those days, uh, there were a few railroads, but not many. And uh, you would uh, go by burrow or mule or horseback. And rugged. It was rugged. We would stay at uh, Posadas, which often were just a native hut. And uh, the, the owners would set aside a 
small portrait for you. I believe this was a wedding party. And uh, when I went down there, many of my friends uh, in New Jersey and New York said, well, are you taking out an insurance policy? It's the day goes down there, there are a bunch of uh, revolutionaries and bandits and they'll, they'll steal your shoes. They'll kill you for your shoes. You better take out more insurance. Well, I found through experience that it was entirely the opposite. They were warm, welcoming people, even the poor people. They stayed in their huts. They would share what little food they had with us. And they were so courteous. I found the way the Americans could learn from them in, in terms of courtesy and, and pride and the dignity they had in life. And here they're dressed in the best. This was a an upper class family, I should say, but they were living in the mountains uh, and those narrow treacherous trails, let me tell you, even a sure few footed mule had its moments. And I recall climbing up there atop a mule, which was a great uh, observation platform for a bird man and looking down through the clouds, 12,000 feet below and you could see the little stream of a river and uh, thinking, my gosh, I hope I, I hope this mule knows what he's doing. And uh, the, they did, or I wouldn't be here. But uh, we saw mules and their packs splayed out on the rocks below many times. It was, a, it was a, a harrowing experience sometimes, in the rain especially. Ah, yeah. now I said, this was, uh, I can't recall the name, one of the steamboats. Uh, Colombia is divided by three mountain ranges, and in the valleys uh, between, uh, on either side of the central range, are two main rivers, the Cauca and uh, the Malvina. They're long rivers, I don't recall the exact length, but uh, part of our expeditions were done aboard these steamers, which uh, would pull in every night, and it was ideal for us because they stopped uh, so often to take on wood or passengers, and uh, we were often uh, the, the, uh, the center of attention, the Yankees uh, the, that uh, were, were hunting birds but didn't eat them. Uh, and uh, again, we met some marvelous people. And uh, you know, we'd go ashore and we'd collect our birds and then we'd prepare them, we'd make the bird skins and always to an audience. Fuertes was a master at entertaining them. Such a such a wonderful man and such a great campmate. If you've ever camped out for weeks on end in, in primitive conditions, and believe me, uh, they were rough. I mean, we were in infested, uh, mosquito infested jungles, and then up high in the mountains where you would freeze at night. Uh, it's some, some men would become a bit testy. Huertas never, he always, always had a joke. He always brought, uh, brought our spirits up. He was, he was a wonderful man. Okay. Oh, this. oh, I, uh, oh this brings back such memory. Where did you get these pictures, Mr. Mr. Alderson? I, I, All the libraries. I compliment you. Of course, in the background, you can't quite see it as well. It's, it is in Ecuador. And this is Chimborazo, uh, and it, uh, I believe it's one of the tallest uh, mountains or really an extinct volcano uh, in the country, I believe about 18,000 feet. And uh, I visited that in 1913. We had a camp on the slopes at about 12,000 feet. I was with their uh, fortress, was with us. My wife, Fanny, my best assistant, and I hope we talk about Fanny. Uh, she's at home right now, but... Uh, what a joy she's been, uh, and always putting my career and my life ahead of everything else. She's been supportive of your career for most of your life. My best assistant, yes. But here on Timbarazzo, uh, we, we climbed the mountain, of course, and it, part of it was we were uh, studying the life zones, and I'll, I'll try not to go into too much detail. I know the audience is not, uh, they're not ornithologists, but uh, most of us understand today that habitat, that habitat has its certain citizens, the birds of the prairie or the birds of the mountain or the birds of the shore. Uh, the habitat, which is the 
the, the food, the water, shelter, and space uh, is, attracts certain species. So you find different birds in different habitats. Now, if you travel uh, longitudinally, say you're in North Florida, we have a different habitat in North Florida, but if you go 400 miles to the Everglades, there's a whole different habitat and you have different birds, uh, different creatures, or, or, or more of them. When, with life zones, think of habitat zones uh, on a vertical, like cake with slices. You go vertically. You don't have to travel hundreds of miles. Sometimes it might be a quarter mile. Then the habitat changes as you go. So at the base, so this is a very crude explanation, but the base may be tropical and you'll see semi-tropical birds. But as you advance, the habitat changes and you see quite rapidly different categories of birds, different families of birds. So it's, it's fascinating. Uh, up at the very top in the snows, the paramo, they call it, you have a whole different, that's a stark habitat, the extremely cold of 10, 30, 40 degrees below zero at night, and then almost summer-like in the daytime, uh, depending, a lot of varieties. Uh, this is in the day and there's plenty of snow there. But the habitat there, it's stunted trees and uh, little brush and uh, in a grass, they call it paramo grass. And there you find different, you find life, but it's different entirely. Now, bird life, Chimborazzo here, I saw my first, my first king of the Andes, and that is the great condor, South American condor with a wingspan of 11 feet, gliding up there, a cloud king. Uh, you remember that? Uh, birds, I mean, I remember all the birds. My first warbler in New Jersey, everyone remembers their first warbler. But yes, yes. That oh, was 11 feet wide. I couldn't imagine that, seeing a bird that wide. Yes. Magnificent. It, it was truly that. Speaking of oh, magnificent, I think most people my, know who this gentleman is. Uh, if they don't, they've not been alive. Uh, right for the last 50, 60 years. This is Theodore Roosevelt. And of course, most know him as a uh, very popular, charismatic, a dynamic president, the man who built the Panama Canal, the man who charged up San Juan Hill. Uh, people have this image of him and it's all true. Uh, but I knew him at a, a, a different part of him and he was a man of many parts. He really told me he had wished as a youth to be a naturalist, like myself, I was very complimented, to tell you the truth. And this man was our Mr. Conservation. Uh, now, I worked with him on many, many studies. I, I was privileged to know him. He had a magnetism that can't be described. If you walked into a room, everyone else just faded into the background. It was like we were black and white and gray and he was in color. Uh, it's such a fine man, a good, a good man. And he wanted to make this country better and he wanted to save the wildlife. People have a stereotype of him with a gun in hand and shooting animals left and right and going to Africa and shooting elephants. Well, that was true, but no one loved wildlife or went or did more things to save our threatened wildlife. And believe me, we're in a war. And we have been for 100 years or, or 400 years since the first uh, white men came to this continent to save our wildlife and our birds, especially. Uh, he led that fight and uh, God bless him. Uh, at Florida, uh, Pelican Island, when, when, I, when we had our honeymoon, Fanny and I down in Indian River Lagoon, Ma Latham suggested we go visit this little island mud flat, uh, Indian River, and uh, we're uh, brown pelicans. Uh, today, the brown pelicans are everywhere, but that was probably the last nesting site that we knew of on the East Coast. They'd been shot out so many times, again, by the plume hunters or the tourists. They would get on a boat uh, and come up from uh, the coast and uh, they'd carry their guns with them and shoot them. They usually leave them in the mud. Uh, there, was a, there was a mental attitude that it's hard to comprehend today. And uh, we went there, I met uh, Paul Kogel, 
it was, it became our warden there. He was an old German. And again, like Ma Latham, maybe he didn't have a, a degree from Harvard, but he knew birds and he studied birds. He knew who I was. He read my articles in the AUK, the professional journal of uh, the American Ornithological uh, Society. He knew them, knew, knew my articles better than I remembered them. And he became our warden there. But to make it quick, I went with William Deutscher to the White House and spoke to Ted about the, uh, no, excuse me, the Colonel. He liked to be called the Colonel. Even when he was president, he preferred Colonel. And uh, we explained that uh, this, uh, this uh, breeding area was in, in danger. And uh, he confided with his advisor, he says, could I declare it a refuge? And they said, well, you can. And he said, how do we go about it? And they said, just say, I so declare it. And he did it. And that was the first wildlife refuge for birds in the country. And today we have several hundred. And I hope uh, in 50, 60 years that there'll be 500, 600 of these. And uh, Teddy, I'm sorry, the Colonel did, did that. And, uh, and didn't you bird watch with him in the White House too? In the I garden? did. I did. We would, yeah. would visit him in the White House and we'd be out there and his wife would shake her head and she said, what, would, what do the neighbors think? The president and this visitor running around like wild men, uh, making uh, bird sounds and we were competing. And, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a competitor and uh, he knew birds perhaps as well or better than I did. And uh, he would rattle off their name, the Latin name, of course, and uh, I would try to keep up with him. I visited him uh, in Long Island at his home, Sagamore Hill, and we'd be talking with others, the great biologists, far greater than myself, of the era, an ornithologist, and uh, the phone would ring and it'd be uh, the Secretary of State, and uh, his wife would come to the porch where we were and say, Theodore, Theodore, you know, it's, it's the Secretary of State. And he would say, oh, we're just in the middle of a fascinating discussion of colorization of birds. He says, can't he call me back? And <laughs> say, no, Theodore, you have to speak with him. He would get up grumpily and go in and then he'd come back and slap his hands together and say, now, gentlemen, where were we? <laughs> he was a man, he wrote 50 books in his time. One was about... Uh, I'm not sure of the title. I think it was Holidays of a Bird Lover. Uh, you love birds. And uh, people don't know, don't know this man. I was lucky to know him. Oh, some beautiful. Photos. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. One of my contributions was to help perfect what we called the habitat display, or now they're calling a wildlife diorama. These are from the museum. Uh, the one on the left is the Cuthbert Rookery. Uh, the gentleman that I told you that was murdered in the Everglades, this was an area that he tried to protect, yet repeatedly that was shot out. At that time, we're talking 1905, we really thought that the roseate spoonbill and the snowy egret were doomed to extinction. This might be the last of the rookeries. And uh, so we went there for, for two different reasons. One, we wanted to educate the public about these birds, but we wanted to send a conservation message that they were under threat. And this is what I brought. I, I hate the word I because it's, it's really a, a group effort. But what I did is I was the organizer. I would select the sites like Cuthbert Rookery, would take an artist, usually Fuertes, if he was available, and he painted this. And I would also take some other experts. We, we'd have the photographers. We'd have the people that would draw uh, uh, charts of the area. And uh, our preparators, they, call, they would make uh, molds of the leaves. If we, if we, and we would take rocks and uh, nests and, and, of course, a bird, uh, examples and eggs and recreate this specific spot. Uh, these dioramas had existed for years before. I, I was introduced once as the man who invented the wildlife time. Well, Bosch, I never invented it. I was one of many. We all stand on the shoulders, as you've heard of others, and I did too. 
but specialized. And what I brought to it was, as the ornithologist, I was insistent on accuracy, and I wanted this not to be generic, but to represent a specific place. And you have to remember, we did this in 1909. And uh, in New York City, I would say most of the working population never went beyond uh, Central Park. They never went to places like this. And of course, there were silent films, black and white, uh, but uh, nothing that could convey. And color film was uh, a dream at that time. So these were educational, informative, and entertaining. And that was my approach. Uh, on the right here, again, Fuertes was the artist. This was a flamingo co colony in the Bahamas in uh, 190, I think this was 1904 or five. And I was lucky enough, I, I penetrated, this was one that we looked for two years for a colony. Uh, the natives, uh, the Bahamians called them uh, jumbies. And they ate them and they ate the eggs. And, uh, they were becoming scarce. Beautiful birds, they stand five feet tall. Uh, an awkward looking creature on the ground, but in, in flight there. They're, they're balletic. They're like a ballet artist in the air. Uh, and no one had ever gotten close to one of these vast flamingo cities. Well, I, I don't want to brag on myself, but I was able to set up a blind in the center of a rookery of 2,000, 3,000 birds. And I had my cameras, and I had my notebook, and my binoculars, and day after day, I sat there only feet away from the nests. And frankly, it was a, a magnificent experience, but uh, it led to, uh, it was a feather in my cap as an ornithologist. And uh, the What country was this again? This was in the Bahamas. Uh, in, Bahamas, okay. I, yes, on Andros Island is the name of it. Uh, oh. And I, by the way, I, I became close to the, the British governor. It's a British colony, as you know. And uh, he was very sympathetic. And he, he pushed through some laws uh, to protect these birds. And we still had them. Again, I, at the time, I, I really doubted that we, we would ever see another flamingo right. in the wild. And, and that's why we went out and, and created this, this diorama. OK. Oh, so you've had a great writing career. So why don't you tell us how you got this magazine started, Bird Lore, and, and, and talk oh. about some of your books, your many books. Well, uh, Bird Lore was a matter of money. I, I married in 1898, and my wife was divorced with four children. And uh, frankly, what the museum was paying me wasn't enough. <laughs> I had long thought that we needed a popular bird magazine for the, the layman. And the, the Audubon clubs were starting to proliferate. Uh, and uh, so I created this magazine. I owned it and I edited it, uh, but it was in league with the Audubon societies uh, and it became their house organ. But uh, it, it was, uh, I was lucky in that I knew many of the big bird writers of America and they all, uh, for the first issue, we had John Burroughs, who some, uh, many, don't remember today, but in his time, he was regarded as a as a wonderful writer. He's New York State. He lived up there in an old cabin called Slabsides, a long white beard, wonderful, wonderful man and a wonderful friend for years. And uh, he's regarded as, as the father of the nature essay. And he was a great, he contributed to that first issue and many other famous names. They, they were so kind in, in helping me this helping me through this. And I edited it for 34, 35 years uh, and time had moved on and uh, I sold it to the Audubon Society. And in a few years, they, they changed the name. Uh, it became Audubon Magazine. Let me change the name again, but this was uh, the parent publication of which I'm quite, quite proud. And it was, it was in, in essence a podium in which to inform and to proselytize people about birds and the need to protect their habitat. 
Uh, now, the book on the right, as I told you about the wildlife dioramas, Teddy Roosevelt encouraged me to write this, this book. I'm sorry, Theodore, he didn't care to be called Teddy. Colonel Roosevelt, he did that. And this came out in 1909. Uh, the, the beautiful uh, cover with the flamingo was done by Fortis, again, Fortis, good, good old Fortis. And what it is is a record of almost 10 years of my work in going out on expeditions to Canada, to Mexico, to uh, Colombia, uh, to, to acquire the materials and the, uh, the specimens to create these dioramas. And the story is told there. Uh, and it, it, it received a wonderful, wonderful response from the public. Uh, I got a very kind letter from President Roosevelt who found it uh, a good book. And uh, that, that alone and a lot, and then the great still does to, to this day. But yes, I, I, I did a lot of writing. I, I think I was among the first as early as the 1890s. I wrote for professional journals, and of course I edited bird lore, but I also wrote for the daily newspapers. Uh, I felt there was a need to reach out to the public, and the way to do that is not through the AUK, the, the Journal of the Professional Ornithologist, but to reach out to the daily newspaper that a man is reading on the subway or a woman is, is reading in her home doing her knitting. So this was, uh, this was, uh, uh, became uh, another job. Uh, but uh, again, all my jobs were labors of love. And uh, I was lucky uh, that in the, in the day, and again, it's I, 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 I was probably the most popular bird writer in America. And I, I wrote 16 books, some uh, serious scientific works, but uh, almost half were popular works. So this was one of them. And uh, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it because we, we again, we, uh, we were instrumental in creating an interest in birds. And of course, by the 20s, uh, bird watching had exploded in popularity. And I'd like to think I, I took a, I can take some small credit for that. I think you, you can take a lot of credit for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, look at you with your big binoculars here. <laughs> binoculars. Uh, this is, uh, I'm losing more and more hair, Mr. Alderson. I, I wish you'd touch these photos up. As you notice, I have my hat on. Uh, there's a reason uh -huh. for that. I see you have a hat on too, Mr. Alderson. But, uh, let's not go there right now. <laughs> this was taken in Panama, and uh, I love to go out on expeditions. Dr. Allen, when I came there as a 25-year-old man, he told me, I can remember sitting there, he was at his roll-top desk, and he said, my boy, he said, you've got to get in the field, in the field every day, every moment, because there'll come a time as you grow older, you won't be able to do it. He was so right and he was so kind because his schedule allowed me, I was still on the payroll, but every uh, winter uh, I would leave New York and go to Florida or go to South America, go to Trinidad, go to Cuba uh, to do my bird work, Canada, Saskatchewan. I mean, we could talk for days and he allowed me to do that. Well, by certainly by 1916, I would say, that trip, we went to Ecuador and uh, we went, ended up in Peru. Uh, that was the last uh, roughing it that I did uh, under canvas and uh, on, on the back of a mule and climbing up the, the mountains. I, Machu Picchu, uh, today I guess it swarms with tourists, but in my day, 1916, there, were, were, there was hardly anybody there. And I climbed the face of that mountain and and walked among the ruins, and, and myself and my son, uh, George K. Sherry, the great, the great collector, my good friend, uh, we, we looked at that marble, that uh, wonderful edifice. We were practically alone. Uh, so anyway, I needed, to, I wanted to study birds, but I, I physically couldn't until I discovered Barro Colorado, which is an island in the Gatun Lake of Panama. It was created when they, uh, when they built the canal. And uh, it was a hilltop 
but then it became an island. And it was perfect, a perfect study area. You could keep people out and it had all kinds of species. And uh, they built a study center there that's, uh, that, that attracts scientists from all over the world. And uh, I visit there now. Uh, well, I probably did my last visit, uh, wrote a book okay. about it, so wrote two books about it. But here I'm on the, uh, it, it's a, a little community and it's like staying at a hotel. And, and I'm, this is right outside my room, it's a platform. And those are 24 power binoculars and I could study the birds, studying more behavior these days. And this is wonderful. You can sit and watch birds for, for eight, nine hours and, and take the notes and you, you learn little bits and pieces of the big puzzle. Or a pendolus, yes, I, I did a paper on that. Uh, and also Gould's mannequin, but, but I'm getting a little technical. It was worthwhile in so many ways. And I wrote two popular books, some of my best writing, I must say. And uh, not a lot of people- well, not quite as physically taxing on no, this type not, of bird watching here. Not, not at all. Not as not a mule or good mules. Uh, good good mules. Good meals. <laughs> no meal. Meals, not mules. Yeah. Right. Right. Wonderful place. Yes. So, Dr. Chapman. So you're nearing the end of your career. So, what kind of retirement plans do you have? You've had a stellar career at the museum, fifty-five years, fifty-four years. What are you well, doing now? My career may be over, but I hope my life isn't. I'm 77 and I still have a fascination of, with birds and wildlife. I started out as a naturalist. I did some work with mammals, but nothing significant, but I'm, I'm still interested. And uh, I'm working on a book right now. I'm working on, I hope to write some papers. Uh, uh, in the near future, my wife and I are going down to Coconut Grove again. Uh, even though it's summer, but we're going down there. And, uh, although we do have an apartment here on Fifth Avenue, and you're welcome to visit us when we're there. It's in the 90s, and wonderful view of Central Park. I, of course, I have my binoculars. I never go without your binoculars or your camera. I have the park on the windowsill there, and you get a wonderful, wonderful view of Central Park, which is a, a mecca, uh, let me tell you. So, uh, I'm looking forward to retirement. Fanny and I, uh, we, we love Coconut Grove. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Chapman, and we wish you well in your retirement. And we There will, are uh, several, excuse me, there are several questions in the chat for Dr. Chapman. Can I read them to you, Dr. Sure. Chapman? Let me close the slideshow and, and um, go ahead, Maureen. Okay. First of all, um, Carla was very interested in the flamingo nests. Can you talk about those a little bit? Well, of course, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, uh, but they're, they look like little pots made of clay. And uh, those are their nests. And they're in a, a sort of a wash, it's called. Uh, and the water level has to be just right for that. And these are huge colonies, uh, breeding bird colonies, uh, cities. They're, they're flamingo cities, and the popular uh, articles I wrote, I described them as that. Uh, in fact, uh, another feather in my cap, again, it's me, 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 but uh, the pictures I took there uh, ended up in Century Magazine, which I, I think is still publishing, but in, uh, in 1905, it was one of the most popular, uh, widely read magazines in the country. Those were the first bird pictures uh, printed by a mass circulation audience. And uh, the flamingo uh, is a magnificent bird. Uh, they, uh, many, many interesting uh, ha uh, habits. And I could go on and on, but I, I think for now, uh, I encourage the gentleman to read my, my book. Uh, I had it right here. Well, I don't know what I did with it, but it's camps and cruises. Uh, of an ornithologist. There's a, a chapter in which I go into detail about my adventures in the Bahamas with the flamingos and uh, pick that up and, and you, you'll Thank get you. to your questions. Yes. Okay, next question. Um, Lynn says, I am struck by the intersection of your life in Florida with three species which are no longer with us. The ivory-billed woodpecker, the Carolina parakeet, and Bachman's warbler. Can you tell about... Oh. 
Your yes, adventures uh, with these birds, such as up and down uh, the Swanee River with Dr. Brewster? The, well, yes, yes. Uh, someone is pretty knowledgeable. Uh, one of the great experiences of my life uh, was with William Brewster of Harvard. He started the museum there. He was uh, what was known back then as a uh, gentleman uh, naturalist. And uh, we, the first letter I wrote him, I, I heard him at the uh, American uh, Ornithologic, Ornithological Union meetings, the Congresses. I, but, but the first uh, letter I wrote, uh, I asked for his, his autograph picture, uh, li like a young boy asking for a baseball player's picture. But eventually we grew into great, great friends and we exchanged hundreds and hundreds of letters. And he was my, he was my brother in so many ways. Uh, but uh, that uh, relationship began on the Suwannee River. And yes, uh, uh, one of our discoveries was the Bachman's warbler. We didn't expect to see uh, that many. Uh, and uh, that was significant. Uh, we wrote a paper on it together, separate papers, I don't recall right now. Uh, but uh, we went down the river on a old scow, a houseboat that we'd remodeled and uh, with a few sweeps or paddles, two weeks down the river, uh, delightful. And we became fast friends. I can remember we'd pull ashore in the evening and smoke and talk. And uh, uh, for some reason, the, the hoots of the, uh, the barred owls uh, sticks in my mind and by the end, we were calling each other by our nicknames, and I'll share that with you. Of course, Mr. Brewster has been dead for more than 20 years, sad to say. But I called him Sahib and, and continued to the rest of our, uh, our friendship, which lasted another 28 years. We went down that river, I believe it was 1893. Not sure, don't remember all these dates so well anymore. And he called me the fiend. Uh, now, your listener will probably want to know why we called each other by those names. But I'm sworn to secrecy, so you can only use your imagination. But he was a fine man. I also saw uh, probably one of the last of the ivory-billed woodpeckers down there. Uh, now, this was a moment of decision. Because in those days, if you were a, a student of birds, an ornithologist, and you ran across one of these vanishing species, you had a decision to make. Should I take it as a, a specimen? Should I collect it, shoot it, put it in a museum so people will know what these birds look like? Or should I not and hope that somehow they'll survive? In that case, to Brewster's dismay, I, I killed uh, an ivory billed woodpecker and I, I uh, uh, ended up um, putting it together as a skeleton and made that decision. Uh, he uh, is a beautiful bird. Uh, uh, Bachman's, Bachman's there, there was another species that's gone now too and I can't think of it. Uh, the the Carolina parakeet. The Carolina parakeet, yes. Uh, so we lost those. But again, put us in the context. Let's go back 55 years, 60 years. We thought so many others. I wrote a, an article in the early 1900s on the skimmers, and the black skimmers, and I mean, the beautiful birds that you see along the shore. I thought they were all gone. Uh, excuse me, I, uh, it's kind of, kind of fire alarms going off here. I hope the building isn't going down, but I'm going to stay through for our interview. Uh, we thought the, sk the skimmers were gone. We thought so many, and, and, but we've hung on. We've done better than we expected. Uh, we really have. But anyway, uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, yes, we have you. a few more. I have a few more in the chat. Um, Maureen, before you get to the next one, let's go yeah. ahead and reveal the true identities. Oh, yes. Questions. And uh, I'm going to take off my hat. So I'm I'm the same person, Doug Alderson. I'm just okay. in the present day now. But this uh, is this uh, is this is going to be a shock. But I am not Dr. Chapman. He's not Dr. Chapman. He is Jim Hupstadt, and he's been writing a uh, 
biography of Dr. Chapman for about 20 years since That's correct. I was working on, at Florida Wildlife Magazine 20 years ago. He was working on this and wrote a yes. wonderful article for the magazine about Dr. Chapman. So at this point, this next question goes perfectly uh, to you as Jim Huffstadt. Oh, okay. So, um, you want to read I'm not, I'm not any dog if you want. Go ahead. I can read it. Uh, part one. This is from Paul Halland. Paul Halland. Uh, Chaflin? Paul Chaflin, maybe. Chaflin, yes. Yes, I know the man. Oh, he's, uh, he's, yeah, I hesitate to think what he might have asked, but go ahead. As a biographer, what first attracted to and then since your decision to select Frank Chapman over so many others? worthy of such research? That's his first question. Well, because uh, I shared something with Frank in that uh, I worked for nearly 25 years for the Illinois Department of Conservation and Florida Fish and Wildlife, then it was the Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, uh, in information education. And uh, among my duties, I was a writer. And uh, Chapman was a beautiful writer. I was also, my, my background is in history and journalism. And uh, I thought, what a, what a great life. I'd stumbled on his book. Uh, I think it was Camps and Cruises of an Ornithologist, which I highly recommend. And I thought, boy, this fellow can write. And he writes about uh, trips out down the river and into the swamps and into the, the jungles. And uh, I thought, uh, in many ways, uh, he did the same thing that I did. Of course, I'm not an ornithologist. I'm not a scientist like he was. But my job was essentially to, to uh, communicate uh, information about fish and wildlife and birds to the public. So in that way, uh, I was uh, similar to Dr. Chapman in that he wrote many popular books, interpreters. Chapman was, I, I often call him bilingual because he could write for the scientific audience, use their terminology. Some people call it jargon, but it's not. It's a scientific terminology. But he had that gift to be able to turn around and write something for the, the average person who may only have a, a vague interest in, in the birds or wildlife, but he grabs them. And uh, he's able to, uh, to use words to create these wonderful pictures. Uh, and again, I don't compare myself to Chapman, but that's what I tried to do. And uh, so that was my attraction to, to Mr. Chapman. And also I thought, here's a man who's, who's largely, except for his uh, connection to the Audubon Christmas Bird Count, largely forgotten. And uh, for some reason, I think we should know, remember this fellow. Okay, so part two of the question, has the intensely personal process of posthumously getting to know Chapman so well changed your life? Significant, significantly, yes. Uh, anytime you do a book, much less one that you've been researching for 20 years, the intensive writing uh, the last five years changes you. And it's broadened me. I'm much more knowledgeable about ornithology and birds and become more interested. And uh, it's amazing. The more you know about a subject that perhaps you're indifferent to. And I wasn't indifferent to birds, but it wasn't the main focus of my life. Uh, but since then, I've uh, joined the Audubon Society. We have a wonderful club here in, in Tallahassee, the Appalachian Auduboners, and I've gone on their, their hikes, and uh, it's, it's a marvelous pastime, and they're wonderful people that, uh, that uh, follow through on this recreation. I recommend anyone, if you're interested in birds, in the outdoors, Join your Audubon uh, club. Uh, you'll never regret it. Okay, Jim, I have a couple questions here. Um, uh, in researching Chapman's life, took you to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City for a week. What did you discover in their archives? Well, again, I go back to when you're writing a book like this, it changes your life. And uh, the people there, Dr. Joel Craycraft uh, runs the, the ornithological department. Um, Paul Sweet uh, was uh, working there as well. He, he works in Chapman's office, which was, uh, Chapman was only there for about eight years because that was the new wing uh, uh, in 1938. 
uh, the, the old uh, place that uh, they moved out. And uh, they treated me with such courtesy and gave me access to the archive. So I was able to go through letter after letter that Chapman had written. And that's a joy. And uh, there's your time machine, Doug. And I think you know that. When you look at letters that were written more than 100 years ago, especially uh, the correspondence with William Brewster, their close friends and others, you see the man and, uh, or the woman, and it is a journey in time, and it's exciting. It's exciting. Uh, it's a laborious and tedious at times, and sometimes handwriting. I always thought the Victorians had perfect handwriting. Well, let me tell you, Chapman's handwriting was not perfect. Uh, Brewster's was worse, but anyway, uh, it, it's a grand adventure. It really is, and uh, they treated me so well, and I learned so much. Uh, I want to thank all the staff there at the museum. Now, how would you describe Chapman's personality after going through all so many personal effects? But uh, that's that's very interesting because it, my goal, I don't know if I'll achieve it, is to create a portrait of the whole man, not just his accomplishments and the dates and where he was and what he did, but who he was. And Chapman, like most interesting men or women, was full of contradictions. He was a shy individual, but he wore a mask. The, the accounts that I researched were written by men who knew him and women who knew him. And they all agreed that you first met him, he was courteous, but he was very reserved. Some people would say cold. And if you look at his photographs, uh, there's a glint in his eye. He looks rather intimidating. And uh, he was a shy man that uh, he kept you at a distance and essentially uh, put you on trial. And if you passed, if you were not guilty of whatever sins he was worried of, worried about, he would let the gate down across the moat and take you into his friendship. And there he was totally different. He was warm. He was funny. He was uh, just a good fellow. And uh, he had all the, uh, uh, he often said before he married his wife, he said, uh, uh, an ornithologist or a wildlife uh, biologist, uh, if he marries, he's a bigamist because his first love is his, is his uh, trade. But uh, if he had, uh, if he was a bigamist, he also had a mistress. And I was golf. And he, he would golf down here in Norman Beach. You know, they would come from about 1912 to 1922 every year, Fanny, and he would spend, uh, spend three or four months at Norman Beach. He liked it for several reasons. One, he says he could look out the window and study the shorebirds with his binoculars, always at hand or he could go and look at the other species. But every day he played golf. And one of his favorite golf partners was John D. Rockefeller. Yes, the old man himself who was pushing 90. But he was a pretty good golfer. And uh, by golly, one day they went out there and uh, Rockefeller was asking him about different birds. And he says, well, could you use some help at the museum? And uh, Dr. Dr. Chapman replied, well, I, certainly we always have expeditions that we're funding and we need uh, improvements in the museum. And Rockefeller wrote a, a check for a million dollars for the American Museum of Natural History. This was in the 1920s when a million dollars was actually a pretty large sum of mon money. <laughs> Today it's not so much, but then it was. So he played golf. He loved to drink. He didn't like prohibition. He went to a private club in New York City with many of his other compatriots and he drank a very sweet cocktail that would choke most men. And uh, one time he was a, a smoker and he smoked these black Cuban cigarettes that were pungent and uh, was puffing out this terrible black smoke. Even then, I, and I'm not sure when this happened, but I'm going to say the 20s or maybe earlier, the doctors at that time, most of them were quite aware there were problems. They didn't call cigarettes coffin nails for nothing in 1900. And uh, Chapman uh, was very uh, worried about his health. And he quit cold turkey. And uh, the people who knew him said he had an iron will. And that was it. Uh, 
one day he was smoking 50 of those a day and the next day he stopped. So he, he had an interesting personality as a, as a leader. He, in 1920, he was named the head of the brand new Department of Birds at the American Museum of Natural History. And he oversaw what is called a golden age at that museum. His staff, each one of them, and I, I can't mention them, there's not time, they're worthy of a biography. In fact, many people have written biographies. And uh, he was the guiding spirit. And uh, my sources that I've investigated, uh, some liked him. Uh, he gave his people a lot of latitude, but yet when the decision was made, that was it. And he made the decisions. They called him the chief, which will give you some idea. Uh, he was also paternalistic. He looked after his people, even if they didn't want him to look after him. There was a young man who wanted to go to uh, South America for bird study. And he told him, you have a young wife uh, and children. Uh, you need to, to take care of them, not go off to South America. And uh, that was resented. Uh, but that, that's the way he was. It, remember, this was a Victorian gentleman. He was uh, very formal. He, he had uh, impeccable morals. Uh, he was a good man, but he was, he was a man of his time. Uh, in his favor, what impressed me is that he would encounter these people with little education. Here in Florida, let's, let's call them crackers. And I, I don't offend anybody by that. But he was able to see behind that image, the worn clothing. If they knew about birds, he wanted to know it. And he respected them. Paul Krogel, uh, Kogel, Krogel or Kogel, in uh, Pelican Island was one. Uh, and many other guides, uh, black, white, if they knew birds, he listened. And I think that's to his credit. Also to his credit, he was a man that had great respect for women as for their intellectual abilities. And uh, he he nursed the careers of several people. One was Elsie Nomberg, a well-educated Jewish lady from New York City. And he encouraged her in her studies. She came as a volunteer in 1916. In the end, she wrote a landmark study called The Birds of Mata Grosso. And uh, he was very proud of that. She idolized the man because she knew he gave her a chance. He didn't dismiss her as just... Uh, some lady who volunteers, you know, go f go file these documents. No, he helped her, he groomed her, and he did that repeatedly. Uh, and I won't go into, uh, so but that was to his credit. He was very progressive. Uh, class distinctions, uh, gender uh, distinctions, didn't uh, didn't appear to make a difference. If, it, if you know birds or wildlife, that seemed to be most important to Frank. I would like to say racial differences, that he was as open-minded. I'm afraid he wasn't based on what I saw, but again, he was a man of his time in 1864. He was not uh, a hateful person, but, uh, but he had attitudes that are today uh, considered uh, certainly, uh, okay, I'm stumbling for words, uh, reprehensible. Politically incorrect. I guess. Thank you, politically. And, so yeah. there's a couple other questions, but they're to Dr. Chapman. So we can, you can answer them as Jim Hubstadt, but one is yeah, Dr. Yeah, Chapman, what advice do you give he, to me? He died 75 years ago. He's not answering any more questions. So you have yeah, to. Yeah, okay. So he's, he's dead, but. Um, so one is how could someone possibly capture this on the page? So it must be challenging. You've been at it 20 years. Maybe <laughs> what are, what is your, uh, what are your plans for the book and how, do you think the book is done? Well, you know, I'm hoping that I'm in the final stages here of the writing. Uh, the writing hasn't been going on for 20 years. Uh, seriously, it started five years ago, and uh, it's been a long trek, a uh, long trek up the mountain. I've been lucky enough to publish four other books. Uh, I do it a little differently. Uh, you know, some people find an agent or they they send a book proposal. I've tried those avenues and it never panned out. So what I do is I write the book and then when I have it, uh, I go out and try to find a publisher to take it on. So if anybody knows of a good publisher who might want to publish a 
a book about Chapman. In fact, if I could throw in another question, uh, people have asked me, uh, Chapman wrote an autobiography. In fact, those of you who are uh, interested, in 1933, he wrote a book called Autobiography of a Bird Lover, which is a charming account of his life, very detailed, well worth the read. Several other books he wrote were autobiographical, autobiographical in nature. And uh, one gentleman said, well, what's the point of writing a biography now? Well, there's a, a great point because that was Chapman's view of himself. Now in my research and looking at the correspondence on file at the museum and uh, University of California online, uh, they have a wonderful collection of Chapman letters. Uh, you know, I can see what other people thought and what Chapman would confide to the page. What you write in an autobiography is not necessarily what you write your best friend. And uh, so it's an updated, complete biography. Speaking of women, uh, the only book written about Chapman, modern book, or only book, except his, his autobiography, was written by a Florida woman at the University of uh, Florida in the late 60s. And it's called uh, Frank M. Chapman, His Journals and Letters. And she describes herself as a, an editor, but she's more than that. Uh, there's a lot of writing, a lot of ex expository uh, writing involved in it. Her name was Elizabeth Austin. She was the uh, wife of the famed uh, author and ornithologist at the University of Illinois, uh, Illinois of uh, Florida, uh, Oliver. Austin, which I have of several of his books. So uh, that's what I hope to do. Uh, now we can, and of course, newspapers. Uh, I can look at the newspaper articles and uh, get a picture of the times. And uh, I mean, I have lofty goals. Whether I'll be able to achieve them, time will tell. Yeah. Well, you've done other books that are published, one on the Civil War, one on Everglades Lawmen of the past. So a good variety of books. Uh, yes, and it shows my difference. I've, I've gotten my discharge from the Civil War, and <laughs> I, I don't want to relive those days. And I've moved on to ornithology and birds, and I've discovered, uh, I discovered a wonderful world out there. Yeah, and there was a question on Pelican Island, but I think you've answered that in the slideshow quite well. Very good. Yes. And from Tim well, Walsh. I will, add this. I will add this. I portrayed... Dr. Chapman in 2003 at the invitation of the manager of the Pelican Island Refuge. They were celebrating their centennial and he had read, uh, written a, a skit, a historical skit, and it featured Theodore Roosevelt and there was a small part in there for Chapman. So I got to go on stage, uh, when was that, 17 years ago, uh, as Chapman and uh, then I didn't have a mustache so I had a phony mustache glued onto my face. And I walked out onto the stage and uh, emitted my first line, which was something like, Colonel Roosevelt, good to see you again. And as I said that, my mustache flew off like a butterfly into the audience. Uh, but I, the trooper that I am, I stood my ground and didn't pay attention and, and finished it up. That was a lot of fun, as tonight has been. I'm there's more than a bit of ham in me, and I'm sure I exposed it tonight. I hope the folks enjoyed it as much as I did uh, doing it. Yeah, you have a couple of nice comments from people on chat. If you go at the bottom of your screen, you can go to the chat. You can read some of the comments. Oh, that's wonderful. And thank, thanks to everyone. Thanks to you, Maureen. And thanks to the, the great reporter here, Doug, Doug Alderson. Thank you guys. This was really great. I have recorded this session and I will send a copy to um, to Jim and Doug and to all the participants if they want to watch it again. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Good night. Stay safe and dry. <laughs>